Welcome to the OOO Ozempic and Semaglutide podcast. Get ready to hear from best selling healthcare author Dr. Josh Luke as he facilitates a discussion on healthy weight loss and living healthy. And now, here's your host, Dr. Josh Luke. Excited to be back with another episode of the OOO Ozempic and Semaglutide podcast. Got a really cool guest. I can't wait to uh, just for you guys to learn from him today. His name is Matthew Hermano. He's a wellness coach from Farmless Health. Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Josh. It's good to be here. Today, we're going to talk about uh, a topic that is uh, really one of the the top questions I get on you know Instagram, on the podcast shows, just via text, email, whatever, and that is how to taper off of GLP-1 agonist, the official name, uh, of course, the most popular name, Ozempic. Nowadays, people are getting familiar with the terms of Manjaro, Wagovi, and the generic semaglutide. The injection world is what we're talking about, folks. So uh, Matt's going to talk to us today and give us his es- expertise on how to taper off GLP-1 agonist. And Matt, I, I did an interview a coach from the Cleveland Clinic who said, hey, I'm telling almost all my clients just to stay on it now for the long term. So do you agree with that or do you have a different perspective? I mean, I think it's a patient, it's a case by case scenario. And I'm sure a lot of people say that as well. Um, There are certain instances where if someone cannot even physically walk because of like either severe inflammation or uh, other alternative disease, like I've treated patients with sickle cell disease, for example, where they have such severe avascular necrosis of their joints and it's very difficult for them to walk. Sometimes an agent like that is a great kickstart to actually like promoting weight loss and then getting them to be able to exercise and um, increase their skeletal muscle mass. So do I think that it has to be a lifelong medication for every single patient? No. And I think that we're all kind of in this gray area about how exactly to taper off of it and like when the right time is and like what are the right foods to eat potentially to transition to make it easier for that patient. Yeah, those are great points. And of course, there's the expense associated with it too. I mean, if your insurance isn't covering it, I think the most common price I hear for people going to a clinic is about 300 a month, maybe 400. Uh, and then if you're doing mail order, you might be able to bring it down, but uh, it's not cheap. And for for the long term, uh, that could be problematic. So, um, so for example, um, my wife's down 50 pounds, she shared with me this morning. I'm so proud of her. She looked good before. She looks even great now. And then I'm down 35 um, going for another five or so, but my plan is to taper off. I'm, I do one, um, full shot a week. My wife's experimented by going up to one and a half, things like that. So what would you recommend for me in a month when I'm ready to say, Hey, I want to kind of taper down and then try going off of it eventually. So, so give me that time sequence, the dosage. How would you recommend that for a guy? I'm six two, 215 pounds. Like what, what do you recommend? Okay. So I would say that there's going to be different like pillars to this like process of tapering off. I think you're going to have to have that conversation of mindset without like not even scientific at this point, but more of a mindset aspect of how are you feeling hunger right now while you're on the GLP-1 agonist? Because there's patients that I've spoken to that have no hunger at all. And mm-hmm. they have such severe fullness when they have like very small amounts of food that transitioning off is very challenging for them. So going through that kind of mindset approach of feeling hunger again, feeling like uh, regular bowel movements, like, cause that's like, that's a vital sign in of itself too, uh, that mm-hmm. we don't really talk about that much. Um, so the mindset aspect of it is really important. And then also the aspect of exercise and building muscle mass. So if you're able to build up your skeletal muscle mass or your lean body mass, you can effectively increase your basal metabolic rate. This is something that is essentially burning calories when you're not even exercising at the same time. And in reality, basal metabolic rate constitutes about 75% of your total daily energy expenditure, which is a massive amount. So if you're able to increase your skeletal muscle mass through resistance training, whether you add in some aerobic training in there as well in a high protein diet or high protein, uh, like foods that you're eating, you're going to make it, you're alive a lot. You're going to make your life a lot easier when you're trying to transition off of it. In terms of the exact dosing to actually taper off again, it's patient uh, example, it's a case by case example, roughly like a 25% dose reduction, like every two to four weeks could be something you could do and mm-hmm. effectively checking in back with the patient to see how you're doing. How's your fullness? How's your appetite? 
um, mental clarity aspect of that, as we already talked about. So those could be some stuff. And then what we're going to talk about in a little bit will be like the foods that actually act as GLP-1 agonists. Maybe there actually isn't really much literature comparing that of a Ozempic to these foods. And I've actually spoken to Novo Nordis asking this question. We don't even know the increase in GLP-1 from Ozempic itself in a numerical amount. So it's interesting to actually think about foods that could help you transition off of the GLP-1 agonist as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. So I imagine that, um, so I will taper off for a month, maybe two, and then um, go cold turkey for a while. Because my goal has been just to change my lifestyle and how I eat uh, instead of doing intermittent fasting. No, as I age now that I'm in my 50s, I want to have a small nutritious breakfast, give my brain some fuel for the day. I want to have a healthy lunch. Uh, and then at dinner, let the cards fall where they may if I'm out or if I'm traveling and and just you know make up for it the next day if you splurge is kind of where my head is at, what I want to do long term. And I've been training myself to do that throughout this four or five month process. But I do imagine that because I do a lot of boating in the summer, I usually gain my weight in July and August. So what would you say if, if for example, I worked with you and I, I called you in July and said, hey, I've been off for four months. I've only gained about eight to 10 pounds in four months, but man, I gained 15 pounds in July, August. I'm going to go back on. What would your advice be for me then? Um, so <clears throat> I would probably like try and first go back to how much weight you lost with Ozempic in general, because the literature that we're seeing now is that people that are off of Ozempic for up to a year regain about two thirds of the weight that they lost initially. So I would first kind of like just see where your baseline was of how much you lost with Ozempic. And then I'd kind of have that conversation with you, uh, where I would look at, you know, again, appetite, fullness, how is your like metabolism or how's your metabolic rate? What have you done since you've been off of the Ozempic, whether it's like physical activity or the foods that you've been eating to maybe have that conversation of like focusing in on that a little more before jumping right back to Ozempic, because there are actual complications by going right back to Ozempic, where if you're influencing your basal metabolic rate that much, there are long-term like potential side effects to that as well. Sometimes it can take like the literature varies, but between six to 12 months between like adjustments of your basal metabolic rate. So it's hard to go back on back off and kind of like fluctuate like that. Great. Great. Okay. Question number two, uh, we're going to talk about foods that act like GLP one agonist. And uh, I've, I've done some reading on this and I'm really excited about that. Uh, so let's talk about some of the foods that, that actually act like GLP-1 agonists. First, explain what that means. Are they making you feel full? Explain what that means. Yep. So GLP-1 agonist is essentially like an incredible hormone that is something that increases the amount of insulin, uh, in increases insulin and helps with insulin uh, resistance, as well as like promote fullness by slowing gastric emptying when you're eating foods. And this is a postprandial effect of insulin where it's beneficial for you. And at the same time, that's occurring in our beta cells within our pancreas, but we also have the actual like uh, prevention of excessive glucagon being released from our alpha cells in our pancreas as well. Wow. So tell me about what some of those foods are. Yeah. So um, there's a couple different foods and it's pretty interesting because it does vary a decent amount. So you can have some higher fat foods. So the foods that I've seen that are in the GLP-1 era or the GLP-1 realm would be something like an avocado, um, fat foods that are like nuts. So almonds, pistachios are some foods as well. There's actually like literature that compared different pistachios to like white bread, for example, that showed like a higher G GLP-1 increase versus that of just plain carbohydrates like white bread. And there's a lot of uh, data with resistant starches too. So when I think of resistant starches, I, my mind immediately goes to like sweet potatoes. I think they're an excellent food that you can add into your diet that will promote fullness as well. There's also like fermentable vegetables. So our greens that I'm always looking at with this would be something like arugula, bok choy. Um, those are like the more common greens that I'll see. And then a big one that we really, I love uh, is extra virgin olive oil. It's another great fat that you can add into your uh, diet as well, that you can usually drizzle on salads or different foods. And there's actually a lot of, the most evidence is with, with the extra virgin olive oil. See that okay. in the Mediterranean diet a lot as well. And then um, also 
it's it's kind of like not controversial, but with eggs has been shown to increase PYY, which is not exactly GLP-1, okay. but there's an there's a hypothesis behind it improving satiety. And if it was actually studied, people are thinking that it might have an effect on GLP-1. Interesting. Always learning something new, right? Okay. And then yeah. also, you know, one of the things I know that you shared some expertise on is just the combination of aerobic exercise and resistance training with GLP-1 agonists. And I've talked before that there's a body of research, really the only negative body of research that I've seen consistently, if you want to interpret it as negative, is that the GLP-1 uh, effect is that you're burning a little bit more fat than you, uh, excuse me, muscle than you would on traditional other diets. It's normally, you know, the percent of your body that's that's muscle burning is between you know, 20 and 25. And with GLP-1s, it appears to be closer to 30 to 35. So just being conscious of that and doing some resistance training, making sure you're heavy on the protein. Uh, is that all accurate? And, and what are your thoughts on that? Yes. Yeah, so I, I definitely believe that um, when you're taking something like GLP-1 agents, in the data we've seen, and it's hard to measure this, it's very hard to measure like actual lean muscle mass versus like fat mass that's lost in a study. But from the data that we're seeing, there is in general, when you lose weight at a rapid pace like that, you're going to lose lean skeletal mass. So as I mentioned, basal metabolic rate is influenced by the amount of skeletal mass you have in your body. So if you're just dropping a, a lot of that skeletal muscle mass, or you're really influencing your metabolic rate. So if you were to just tag on aerobic exercise with this, I do think you have, there is literature to show this too, that you sustain weight loss and it can be done together. The long-term effects of this though, if you're only doing aerobic exercise, that's kind of like in question. We don't really know like long-term if that would be a sustainable routine to keep doing like, say like runs every day while G on GLP-1 agonist versus what I'm like suggesting is the actual resistance training aspect, which is like uh, muscle building, whether it's through like um, doing TRX, whether it's do dumbbell training, compound weightlifting in a safe manner, obviously with right instruction, but there actually isn't much literature that I could find with resistance training in combination with the GLP-1 agonist, which I think everyone wants to see. And I wouldn't be shocked if you saw it maybe in the next like couple months or so. Well, it's really interesting stuff. And um, are there any other um, foods that, that act like GLP agonists? Because some people that, that do have side effects uh, may just say, hey, or maybe it's a financial issue too. Like if you were to list off maybe like three to five foods that they would want to, you know, kind of put as mainstream in their diet that act like GLP-1 agonists, what would they be? I would definitely say that almonds and avocados are great examples Almonds are very unique because not only do they have that fatty aspect in them, but also a decent protein amount as well. But they have this thing called the post or the second meal effect, where not only do you reduce uh, the actual like postprandial glucose of the first meal, but it actually like starts to trickle down into the second meal as well, which is a really unique aspect of food that I haven't really seen too often. I like avocados because they're very satiating and it's a really good amount of fat that you're putting into your body. And then olive oil as well, hitting on the fats again, this can be drizzled on top of your salads. You can drizzle it on other foods like fish, for example, and extra virgin olive oil is just an excellent thing. It's tried and true. We know so much data with it, with the Mediterranean diet, where we all can feel very comfortable about consuming it. Well, this is some great stuff. So so just in summary, um, if people are going to start the, in, become a part of the injection revolution, um, in, before I get kind of to wrap up with how, you know, tapering off, how you recommend tapering off, how much weight are you seeing your clients lose per month on average and how long are they staying on the injections or is it just all over the board? Yeah. So, I mean, like in general per month, you can but you can probably see about maybe a kilogram like per week. So uh, maybe like four kilos per month. So that might be like around like 15 pounds or so. Um, this, this effect can be seen where someone can go up to, they could be percentage too. So up to 15% of someone's like total body weight that's lost. If you actually can continue it for about a year or so. Um, what was the second question you had? I'm sorry. Uh, just about, um, recommending a tapering off is it a 62 month process I, I know you said every two weeks um is it just four weeks that you do that is it eight weeks that you do that what do you think 
Oh, I would say probably, I mean, like every two to four weeks, you'd probably have the check-in to reduce the dose, maybe 25%. And okay. again, it's going to depend on the client. I would say like, again, I, I really think that you need to be consuming a high protein diet, building muscle and kind of, I'm curious, like, yeah, I just want to know those things for someone where they're at in their life too, you know, stressful times. It's yeah. like telling someone just to taper a medication when they're in like, maybe they lost their job or like they had a breakup, like that's not a realistic yeah. thing. So you're going to have that like genuine, like discussion with the patient sure. too. Yeah. yeah. I believe that to be true. And, you know, I started mixing in a couple of protein shakes a week, which I've never done because I am very concerned about that early evidence that says there's a little bit more muscle burn than the norm. And I'm so focused on just um, managing my calorie and carb content that I don't focus as much on protein. And so uh, I throw one of those down every few days and I, I feel more confident that I'm I'm getting the necessary protein. So just to wrap up, could you share with the audience um, just a favorite go-to food, meal, snack of yours that's maybe 300 calories or under that that you just think tastes great as well that might they might be able to work into their repertoire? Yeah, definitely. I'll usually do, um, I'm on the kefir uh, bandwagon right now. Kefir is just this, it's a little different than Greek yogurt. So I'll do a, it has like a, the lactase enzyme actually in it. So if people who are lactose intolerant, maybe it's an option for them. Great. Um, but basically I'll do like a kefir bowl with like maybe uh, some berries of sorts. So blueberries, some raspberries, to, uh, sprinkle in some pumpkin seeds on top of that. Maybe I'll slice up a banana and that's kind of like some, some stuff I'll eat in the morning as a little snack. Awesome. And can you spell kefir? I'm not sure I'm familiar with that. Yeah, it's K-E-F-I-R. And is it like a oatmeal type? Is it more like a yogurt? What do you? Yeah, sorry. I should have explained it more. It's a, it's a yogurt and uh, it's, it's actually, it's from like milk. So kefir grains are a bacteria you can just dump into milk and it actually ferments and it creates this like natural probiotic that's even more potent than like Greek yogurt and without the lactase as much as that of Greek yogurt. So you get your protein. It's a little more liquidy than Greek yogurt, but it's a nice alternative that you can mix in with uh, if you didn't want to do a yogurt. Great. Hey, thanks so much. Uh, my guest today was Matt Hermano, uh, a wellness coach uh, from Farmless Health. He shared some great stuff about foods that naturally can give you that same effect, about tapering off. And uh, Matt, just really grateful you joined the show. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Josh. You've been listening to the OOO Ozempic and Semaglutide podcast. Dr. Josh Luke is a PhD, but not a medical doctor. And none of his comments or comments of his guests are intended to be medical advice. Make sure to like, follow, share, and subscribe to the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll be back soon with a new episode.